Okuma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Today on Politics 360, political analyst Ibrahim Fakir joins me to discuss the pros and cons of one of the Zondo Commission's recommendations that South Africa's president should be elected directly rather than via parliament. In his final state capture report, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo said, Consideration should be given to amending the constitution amendments so that the president of the country should be elected directly by the people. So what is meant by such a direct election of the president? How would it work and how would it differ from our current system? So I think what Chief Justice Zondo is suggesting is that South Africans come together uh, and vote for the president directly at the moment what happens is that we vote in an election for provincial legislatures, so MPs at provincial level, and we vote for MPs at national level, right? So on two different ballots. And then we work out on a proportional basis how those seats are allocated to the parties. Now, remember, the Electoral Act has to be amended because of the constitutional court finding of June, uh, I think 2020, in fact, slightly earlier than that, uh, the parliament was given two years to come up with a new electoral system. But that didn't say anything about the direct election of president. Because as you've asked in the current system, when we vote for those MPs at national assembly or provincially for the provincial legislatures, they then from amongst themselves elect one person to be provincially the provincial premier at national level the president so effectively the president is formally in terms of the rule in terms of the constitution in terms of the laws he is indirect or she is indirectly elected from amongst the members of the national assembly and the national council of provinces coming together they vote they elect the president right at the first joint sitting same is true for the provincial legislatures, provincial parliaments. So what, what we are effectively doing is that the head of the executive is drawn from amongst elected MPs. Now, remember, our system is a list-based system, which is a party-based system. And so um, people who are high up on that list are likely to be, you know, the ones who are going to be elected president or alternatively you would say the party which has the highest number of seats is going to effectively determine who the president is theoretically it could be any one of the 400 members of the national assembly as long as they get the majority of votes to be voted into that office what chief justice zondo is suggesting in his report is that that mustn't be the way there mustn't be an indirect election of the president the president must be directly elected so when we vote for an mp how irrespective of how we vote whether we're voting on uh, on a party basis on a, on a pure proportional representation for mps etc in the same way we must all have a vote one ballot paper in which we must directly vote for the president so the president stands or the individual he or she stands as a person as a uh, as an individual candidate whether they're tied to a party or not tied to a party etc and they stand up and say i tabi madiba wants to stand as the president of the republic you appear on the ballot paper of course if you satisfy the criteria like pay a deposit or whatever the criteria put in by law and regulation if you satisfy those criteria you are the candidate and you will compete against whoever you know, Ibrahim Fakir, um, Cyril Ramaphosa, and people will individually vote for that person. So that's the directly elected president. Now, some people say that has many advantages because the people have a direct say in choosing who the head of the country. But in this case, we must understand clearly, it's not just, you know, colloquially, you are talking about the head of the country. Technically, you are talking about the head of the country, yes, but it's not just a ceremonial position. It's not just the president who's there in name. This person exercises a great amount of executive power. That means that they can control, and they do control budgets. They control the arms of government. They have major executive power concentrated in them. And so 
they saying legitimacy is derived directly from the people and therefore this president should be imbued with a heck of a lot of power to be able to determine and make all kinds of decisions without restraint from the legislature because remember he's he or she is directly elected so if there are problems it is very hard for the legislature for parliament for the representative body to be able to call these people to account or to remove them from office why because they say well who are you to recall me who are you to tell me what i should do who are you to ask me to answer to you when i have been directly elected by the people i'm only answerable to the people this has happened and of course america has a uh, almost directly elected president this there's, there's elements of indirect election in the sense that it's elected through an electoral college and so on but if we think more immediately uh, president mugabe in zimbabwe uh, in Uganda, in Kenya, the president is directly elected. And we know that many Zimbabweans used to complain about the fact that effectively what you have is an executive monarch. You have a, a person who is elected into office, who has so much of concentrated power that's focused in them, that there are very little restraints, there are very little constraints on how they use and abuse that power even. So if you think in the American context, the, the president has so much power even to go to war and there's very little veto powers by the elected houses to be able to recall them, except if they are incapacitated or if they are up on a criminal charge, in those cases they can be impeached. But there is an, an intermediary level of accountability, an intermediary level of recall or discipline. Um, when you have directly elected president. So people say the advantage is that everyone have a say and that much is true. Every, uh, people say that they will derive their legitimacy directly from the people themselves. There's an element of truth to that. But the question is, when you can derive that legitimacy from the people generally in other indirect elections too, because we want the House of Representatives, those people who represent us, the Parliament, the National Assembly, if they elect this person to be the head of the government, to be the head of the executive, at least they have an oversight mechanism over that president they can restrain his or her powers. They can make them answerable to the legislature. They can say the separation of powers are much more effective, in other words. And so I think it's important, in, and, and I would argue for an indirectly elected president or indirectly elected executive rather than a directly elected executive. Because directly elected executives, firstly, the disadvantage is they have unrestrained power. They think they've derived their legitimacy from the people themselves, so they're not answerable to the parliament. There is an intermediary level of accountability. And in a, in a system like ours, even if and Zondo Commission makes another proposal, that is to say that parliament should have some constituency system, that makes sense. Why? Because you are electing representatives, people who are going to represent citizens. It's fine to directly elect those people into a body of others who are going to represent interests, who are going to represent viewpoints, who are going to represent people. But when the executive authority is directly elected, you want them to be answerable to you because after all, no executive authority comes every week, or every second week, or every month even to the people in general and gives them answers or accounts to them or they don't hold oversight over them that frequently because when the person is directly elected into executive office the amount of control they have over budgets over decision making over policy over legislation all of that they can ram it through a parliament and there are very little restraints on and more broadly, you have argued that the electoral reform in the country should strike a balance among a range of factors, including inclusivity and diversity. So can you tell us more about your vision for electoral reform? I, I've argued that the electoral reform should balance voice. That means each citizen should have the maximum amount of voice and the maximum amount of choice. And so in doing so, you also want to consider 
that everyone is as broadly inclusive as possible, that all the votes are counted. Now in constituency system, right, it's what they call first past the post systems. Imagine you and I stand in an election, let's say for example, in the city of Johannesburg, theoretically as an example. And let's just say there are a hundred people, uh, and two people don't vote, so there's 98 people. You get 46 votes uh, and I get 48 votes. That means I will take all the seats. All the 48 people who voted for you are effectively unrepresented. Now, yes, because the system is, it's a credible system. It means that all of the people who voted for you might feel completely unrepresented, right? So a proportional representation system has the advantage of inclusivity. But look at the experience that we've had of pure proportional representation in South Africa thus far. Yes, it's been very inclusive. Yes, it's uh, accommodated diversity. Yes, it has not wasted votes and it has allowed a maximal participation. It has given smaller voices an opportunity to be represented in legislatures and elsewhere, uh, which could have ordinarily been excluded. Typically, you know, when, when men and women are, are running against each other in a constituency election, it is like that men win out. So in, in a proportional representation system, you can have better representation of women, of minorities, of the disabled, and so on. So it's got distinct advantages. But the disadvantage is that it is very, very party-based. So the party holds all the power. There is very little discretion that the individual MP can exercise outside of party discipline. Why? Because they're deriving their mandate from the party, because they want to be high up enough on the party list. It makes party bosses extremely powerful. Um, but it also means that when the party bosses decide a certain way, then that's how every public representative in that party has to has to follow that route. So it is heavily party based. It takes away much of the discretion and the exercise of choice and voice that uh, citizens would want to ordinarily uh, exercise. And the fit between the elected representative and the constituency that they're purporting to represent is very tenuous, it's very weak. And so a mix of the two systems would be ideal. Now, you will have very many complicated mixes, right? So we don't want too complicated a system because simplicity is also an important value. So you want inclusivity. You don't want to waste votes. You want diversity. You want effective representation. Uh, but you also don't want the system to be so complex that you account for all these values and you come up with a system which is very difficult for ordinary people to understand, ordinary voters to understand, but more importantly, becomes incredibly difficult for the election manager and election administrator to manage and administer. Because when there's those complications, the space for conflict goes up and social conflict, which begins from electoral processes where people don't understand it, the transparency mechanisms and the oversight mechanisms are weakened because of the complexities of the system. It can engender major conflict in society. So you want it to be as simple as possible. Now, because you want to maximize all the good values, there is no system which can perfectly accommodate all of these values to the maximal event. My argument has been that we should have a mix between 400 constituencies and 200 MPs elected off a PR list so that we can combine the maximal effectiveness of voice and choice, give the most amount of power and influence to the individual voter, and take it away from the parties. Parties will still be a major feature, sure, but citizens then take greater responsibility. The governance impacts could be that you will have better alignment between the constituency representative at national level and that of provincial level and at local government level so that they then sort out, even though they have different functional areas, improved efficiency and the functioning of schools, of hospitals, of government services in those areas because there's better liaison and coordination between the representatives of that area. And those representatives know that their performance, their re-election, though parties will be strong in the system anyway, their re-election 
is dependent on the people in that area, they are much more likely to want to service and serve the people in that area rather than merely the parties or be in it for themselves. Now, of course, people get elected into these positions so that they can dispense patronage, so that they can uh, also benefit themselves. No one arguing that that can't be the case at all. But there has to be a balance struck between that and serving and being of service to the community. And I think when there's a better constituency system, you will have better representation, you will have better oversight, you might have better accountability. Some people say the local government system at the moment has that, but there isn't better accountability. Uh, so the potential for those things might exist, but there will certainly be space and opportunity for better coordination. When you combine those, it might mean that you might have a better functioning system of oversight, accountability, and coordination of government service delivery. Now, this district development model that government's talking about implementing, you know, tries to address this question of coordination, but because the derivation of, of the source of legitimacy is from the party list, that the opportunity to oversee and provide oversight over the bureaucracy will be limited. So you would have a better district development model if you change the nature of the electoral system to have a stronger constituency element included in it. Um, and perhaps that's been the reason why I suggested uh, the system that I did. The disadvantage is that it does increase the size of the national legislature to 600 rather than 400. But if you look around the world, countries which are uh, roughly the population size of South Africa do have representative institutions of about 600. You could cut costs elsewhere to afford having an additional 200 MPs, which are drawn from, from smaller sized constituencies around the country to effectively represent uh, South Africans uh, and ensure better government through improved oversight, improved accountability, while also retaining all the democratic values of inclusivity, of diversity, of maximal representation, of not wasting votes. And the system is relatively simple to administer and simple for people to understand. So it conforms to all those good values and gives the, the voter the greatest amount of voice and choice. And why do you argue that governance and regulatory architectures ought not to be chopped and changed too frequently? Simply because it will create anarchy. Um, I think, you know, you don't want to change the system of government too frequently. Imagine, today you have a presidential system, tomorrow you have an indirectly elected president, today you elect MPs uh, through a proportional representation system purely, next election you have a hybrid system. The whole architecture of government starts to fall apart, creates too much anarchy, there is no control. So you don't want to change government systems willy-nilly at least not the thing, big things like the electoral system or the nature of the executive and cabinet. Largely, the constitution has settled this. We do need amendments in the constitution because the system I'm arguing for is going to require that, some minimal amendments. But they're not major. They're not going to overhaul the entire system completely. In any event, the constitutional court has said you need to change the electoral system because it is unconstitutional. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a directly elected president. I've argued why I think directly elected president is a bad idea. Uh, but it can mean that you can have directly elected representatives for representative institutions, sure. And South Africa has had 27 years or more of the current system. Coinciding with it, the court has made a decision that it needs to be changed. This is an opportune time to improve that. And we've seen through state capture, uh, that if you had a, a differently configured parliament, parliament may have played a stronger oversight role and may not have necessitated the Zondo Commission. If parliament had played a better oversight role, had held public representatives, and especially public representatives in cabinet who were exercising executive power to better account, we may not have had need for such an expensive exercise, number one. Number two, you might have had better and, and more efficient and effectively performing prosecutorial and security agencies. They may not have been caught up in the factionalized battles of an overweening party where success in the party determines success elsewhere. Deriving legitimacy from different sources, 
broadly through the public is a better idea for individual representatives. And that would have then incentivized them to exercise better oversight and demand better accountability from... Uh, now imagine if you had state capture, right? And you had a directly elected president and that person is captured for, for one reason or another by extraordinary and inordinately negative influences which are malevolent to society. They all they need to capture is one person. Here we succeed. You see that there's been a succeeding of capturing an entire party. Now imagine if you concentrate that much power in one person, how much easier it is to do that. And you know, whether you like it or not, we might not like some of the politics of the EFF, at least the way in which they behave. But look at the example of the way in which their behavior can use a representative institution like parliament to be able to more or less, and even though much of it is very unsavory in, in its approach politically, at least it's giving flavor to the legislature, to the to the parliament, to the body of representatives, to demand a level of accountability. Uh, demand a level of answerability, or at least raise issues which ordinarily would not be able to raise, which is why I think it's important to have this intermediary level of accountability through a parliament, um, and, and why it's better to have that system rather than have a directly elected president, but, but also why it then, if you have split the system where you have an indirectly elected president who heads the executive and executive power, uh, split from the way in which ordinary MP are going to be elected directly in a direct constituency system because they're fulfilling two different types of functions. Uh, and that's why I think that separation would be important, would bolster a greater amount of separation of powers and would allow a greater amount of independence of the representative institutions which ought to represent the public. And lastly, Ibrahim, so do you think if Parliament introduces a constituency-based electoral system, it would enhance the capacity of MPs to hold the executive accountable? You know, it does. I think it does. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of other factors which matter for how well or badly an MP performs. Of course, their own attitude and their own aptitude, firstly. Secondly, how seriously they take concerns raised by their constituencies and so on. Third, their um, own ethical predisposition uh, and, and so on, right? So those big factors do matter. There are other practical factors which matter, the amount, you know, access to research, um, understanding the nature of the content and the, and, the, and the substantive issues before consideration, understanding the process by which Parliament works, because you don't just raise a question. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a way of having it placed on the order paper, which has to be vetted. There's rules committees, there's other committees through which this goes through. All that aside, I think at the broad conceptual level, if there is a more constituency-based system, it incentivizes individual MPs to perform on the basis of what their constituents want from them. And they will be better able to effectively represent what they want, right? And if they perform poorly, if they perform badly, if they seem in parliament to be siding with, with people who are doing the entirely wrong thing, the likelihood of them being re-elected by that very constituency is going to be low. Now, of course, there are downsides because in, the, in a country like South Africa, you know, the spatial apartheid patterns re remain. So it means constituencies may return MPs of a particular race, of a particular flavor. People say that, you know, ethnicity might come into the mix, that they will, they will, they, they will have ethnic entrepreneurs who will stand and maybe stand on, on, on very recidivist kind of some people call them populist, other people say they, you know, they're recidivist issues, but hey, that if that's what people want, that's what people want. We should give them, if you want the electoral system, and if democracy is about giving people the maximum amount of voice and choice, then you allow them to be able to choose representatives on the basis that they want, and those issues get arbitrated at the, at the site of the representative institution. But if parliament has individual constituencies electing individual MPs to a greater extent than they do at the moment, or in any envisaged system that they have before them in terms of the draft bill. It means that those MPs are incentivized to represent their constituencies to a stronger degree than they are to their parties or any other thing, even though parties will still, you know, form a, a greater influence in the political system. It at least gives 
MPs, individual MPs, a greater amount of discretion to exercise judgment on the basis of ethics and the basis of uh, what their constituencies want them to do. Sometimes you may find that an MP will vote against the wishes of what the constituency that, that they come from um, want from them. But then they have the opportunity to actually explain to those people why and justify the reasons why they did so. At the moment, if you think about this, you voted for a party. If you voted for a person off a party list, it's very rare that an individual, that a person, that a public representative can rationalize to you why they decided to vote a certain way. The ultimate rationale would be because the party said we should vote that way. That was political analyst Ibrahim Fakir speaking to Krima Media's policy about whether South Africa's president should be directly elected. Thank you.